Um, her name is Magda Bader, and um, her daughter Annie is right there next to her. And um, I could introduce her, but she didn't want me to introduce her because she wants to tell you her story herself. So Magda, please come on up. I don't know if you want to stand. Good evening. Nice. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I am glad to see you here. It's not a very easy subject to listen to, and it's not a very subject that you saw so many pictures. Can you hear me, or shall I talk louder? Okay. So I will t tell you just about myself, what happened. When I look at you guys, I was about the same age as you are now. So when all these things happened to me, I'm from a, thank you, I can see better now. <laughs> I, I was born in Czechoslovakia. If there is a map somewhere. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay, but it's okay, it's okay. All right. Thank you, thank you, Caitlin. Okay, so this, around this area where I was born, it was a small town, only 30,000 people and half of the population was Jewish. And when I was born, it was Czechoslovakia, but when I was nine years old, it became, it got connected to Hungary. So we had to learn a different language, but in my family, my parents spoke Hungarian because they were born before the First World War. So Hungar Hungarian language was our main language. Some of my brothers and sisters s learned to speak Czech, but I never really learned to speak Czech. I could understand a lot, but I wasn't really very good at it. But my parents sent me a Hebrew Zionist elementary school. So from first grade till about uh, fifth grade, I, I learned every subject in Hebrew. Probably many of you speak better Hebrew today than I did then, but when I would go to, used to go to Israel and people said, how come you speak Hebrew? I said, that's just what I'm telling you, because um, they said American kids learn Hebrew, but they don't really have a fluent knowledge of the language. They can pray but not have a conversation. But when you learn every subject in Hebrew, it was easy for me. Anyhow, we were Hungarians from 1939 until 1944. Uh, I had to go to a Jewish girl middle school then. No, I couldn't go to the Hebrew school anymore, but I had to go to this Hungarian Jewish girl school. And I was there from fifth grade, sixth, seventh. Okay, thank you. I'm not used to speaking like that. Anyhow, um, we were still at home. My family was a big family. There were 10 children in my family and I was the youngest. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, can you tell which is me, of course? <laughs> the little girl. I was about four or five years old here, I think. I remember actually when this picture was taken of my family, because all these big people, grown-ups, were already grown up when I was born. <laughs> so like my oldest brother was 27 years old when I was born to the same mother, same father. 
And my mother got married when she was like 18. She had her first son, this one, when she was 19. And then so many children came. So this was my young, I was here. And many of my siblings were not even at home when I was growing up. And they got, came home wherever were they, they were many of them already out of high school. Many of them went to a Hebrew Zionist high school also when we were Czechs. And so there was a lot of, <clears throat> in my town was like half of the town was Jewish and most of them were Orthodox. There was a beginning of a movement of of, of Zionism, and so that's why this high school was in existence, and the Hebrew elementary school. We were living in a big sort of country type of house with a big backyard, uh, like a fruit orchard behind the house, and, uh, and the children that I was fr friendly with were all neighborhood children. I remember when we were Czechs, they were a really a very democratic country, and they allowed every, all the minorities have their own school. But even those days, when I went to the elementary school, I walked, walked always, I had to be careful. I crossed the street because the kids who lived on that street, they used to say, dirty Jew. I was sort of accepted it. Nobody was thinking anything and I just walked on the other side of the street. Later, things were much worse. When we, we became Hungarians, we had several restrictions. We had to uh, for, have curfews, couldn't go out after a certain time in the evening, or it was limited to what the, where we could go. Wearing, we had to wear a yellow armband, not a star, but a yellow armband. And we were restricted to only listen to the news that were propaganda, because Hungary by that time was fully collaborating with the German government, with the Nazis. And so whatever the, they were dictated, they followed. So we had to only listen to this German Nazi propaganda, and they put on our on our uh, radio because, of course, you know, t television did not exist. A radio was the most only source of information, and they put a seal that we could only listen to this uh, art, this propaganda news. One day, one of my sisters was able to remove the seal from the radio, which was a da big danger to do it, but she did it, and we were caught that, that the seal was removed. And we got into trouble, and our radio was taken away, and all that. I was, had the job to walk outside the house, be careful to see that nobody is spying on us, that we were listening to the other stations, other stations meaning like Voice of America or the British Broadcasting News. But we were still all at home. When I say we, it was five sisters, including me, and the four brothers and a sister were not living at home. They were in the capital of Czechoslovakia in Prague, they tried, we were Hungarians, and Czechoslovakia was occupied by the Nazis. They tried from, from Prague to go to America or to go to the British, to Britain, Great, Great Britain. If that they couldn't just get a ticket and travel, they had to be invited and they had to be, have a guarantee that somebody will take care of them. They won't be the burden of these countries. 
And if the papers didn't come through time in time, they had no chance. So what happened was that only uh, one brother managed to get to England, which we did not know for a long time. The others tried to go someplace, but they ended up coming back home. My four brothers, only the three of them came home. They ended up, they were not voluntarily, they were forced in a, what they called forced labor under the Hungarian army. And their job was to put down mines because the war was already in 1942 already between Russia and, and Germany. And because Hungarians collaborated with the Germans, they were fighting on the, or, or, together with the, with the Nazis. I was a little girl. Uh, you can figure out how old I am if I was born in 1930, right? How old was I in 1930? In, 19, in 1944, how old do you think I was? Yes. 14? Yes, I just turned 14. Exactly. Are any of you 14? Okay. So when I look at you, I'm thinking of you all look so beautiful and handsome and healthy. And I was like a little, a little kid. Anyhow, what happened to us what happened to Poland, the Jews in Poland or other countries in Europe, it happened much earlier than to us. So uh, the, po the Jews from Poland already in 1939, they had a lot of difficulty and they were putting ghettos and all that. With Hungarian Jews, in the spring of 44, when just I turned 14, we got an order to vacate our home and make and move into another street, which they made into a ghetto. So we happened to have some family members who lived on that street. We moved in with them. They, the, the Hungarian collaborators, they called them the Arrow Cross. Um, in Hungary, in, in English, in Hungarian, it was Milos. They were uh, conducting their, their ways just like the, the SS and the Nazis. Uh, we got a ruler ruling in, in 24 hours. We have to vacate our home and go and to live in this street, which they sealed off on both ends and there were German shepherd dogs and, and the guards with a weapon, not allowing people coming in and out. The night before we had to go to this ghetto, uh, my mother was, was trying to save some things that when we come back to our home, that we will find it. Like, for example, some menorahs or some, uh, something that was very important to the family. So we all helped her to hide this stuff in a woodshed that we used to keep our firewood and hoping that when we will come back, we will find that. The very next day, when one of my sisters, who was very courageous, she told to me, she asked me to go with her and try to sneak back to our home and see what's going on. And that's what we were able to do. Although we were not allowed to, but we took a chance and we went through the back because there were gardens and fruit orchards connected and we found that the very place that we we hid these items, like the menorahs. It, they were dug up, and it was dis disappeared. So this was only a minor thing in the scheme of the rest of the things that happened to us. 
So we were in this ghetto for a few months, like three months, and then a rule came that we have to vacate the ghetto and start marching. We had no idea <coughs> what was in planned for us. We were hoping that the family members will be able to stay together and the young people could work. But of course, this wasn't happening. What happened? We had to march a big distance, like five kilometers, to a big open area. It was like end of May, and it was very, very hot. And they made us five people lining up each with, next to each other and start marching. They said, we can take with us whatever we can carry in our hands. Uh, I remember that <clears throat> my grandfather and grandmother were marching along us. My grandfather could hardly walk. He fell down, and my mother tried to help him to get up. But the guard, as the, with, his, with his gun, he hit my mother with the butt of his gun and forced her to get up and keep moving. And so she, my grandfather remained on the ground. And that's the last time that I saw my grandfather alive. After this long march, we arrived to a big open space, like a football field, or probably bigger. I have no idea, because I don't go to football games. But it was a big, big open air. And there was nothing, no buildings, just grass and concrete floors. It was a brick factory, which was all open to air. And, and there were lookout towers where the guards were looking at us and trying to discourage people to take a chance to escape. So periodically they were shooting and they hit some people and they pulled those people out of the way and that was our welcome there. We still did not know where they're going to take us and for how long we will be away from home. Uh, we did not know there were such things as concentration camps and, and we thought that it will be like a, an internment camp where the family will stay together. For a few days we were in these big open spaces and then an order came to start getting ready because we could see that this, this big open space, what it had, was railroad tracks. And we knew that if there are railroad tracks, that meaning that they will have ideas to take us somewhere. And then on the railroad tracks, uh, these cattle cars arrived. And the order came that we have to line up and, and get on the cattle cars about a hundred persons into each cattle car. The only people who were actually at home at, at this time already were young children, women, and older men, like fathers, grandfathers, because the younger men were already before taken in this forced labor. So there were hundred people forced into each cattle car the cattle cars were very dark. There were little openings on top for the cattle, but the, and over those little openings, there were barbed wire, so people should not even get an idea that they, they could escape. There were little children, grandfathers, and women. It was very, very noisy right away, lots of crying, lots of uh, feeling uncomfortable, to say the least. And they gave us two buckets. One bucket 
the water to drink and the other bucket to use as a bathroom facility. You can imagine for 100 persons, not, neither lasted very long. We were locked up into these uh, cattle cars and then the cattle cars started to move. The older people got the idea that we are going towards Poland. We were in the cattle cars for a few days, and I can tell you that I don't remember much what happened there. Finally, when we arrived, to a so-called destination. They opened the guards, opened the cattle cars, and we were told to move fast. The women, children, one way, and the men in another direction. And then there was a voice that was rather pleasant, said, don't worry, you're going to see each other again. Don't worry, soon you're going to see each other. I remember I was together with four sisters, and one of my sisters had a little child, and my mother, my father, that they kept reinforcing and stating, don't worry, you're going to see each other. We sort of went along with that, I let my mother's hand go, and she went with my sister with a little child, and I stayed with my three grown -er, more grown-up sisters. And that's the last time that I saw my mother, my father, my sister with a baby. And what the place that there we were, we arrived, the place was Auschwitz. Auschwitz was the biggest extermination camp in Poland. And wherever you, one looked, you, one could only see railroad tracks with cattle cars and, and lots of barbed wires, fences, and lots of horrible looking uh, barracks. They all looked alike, there was no grass. There, was no, there were no trees. There was only what I just described to you. We were hoping that we will get to see each other, but it never, never, never happened. So this was, Auschwitz was a whole big, big world there. And the part that we were taken to was called Birkenau where mostly the Hungarian Jews were taken, other Jews too, from most of the countries from Europe, whether it's from Greece or Belgium, France, all came different times. I was in a barrack together with a thousand women, young, there were no, I was about one of the younger people there. There were not many young people. And when we had got there, they made us whatever we carried in our hands drop. Everybody still had with them whatever was special to them, whether it was a prayer book or whether it was a sidur or whether it was some jewelry, whatever was special, they held on for dear life. But the first order was drop everything and there was a big pile of stuff that everybody just saved for themselves, but it didn't happen. The next barrack that we were forced to go to, they, gave, they wanted us to be disrobed. And the third barrack, one barrack was one behind the other, next to each other, we, our Hats were shaved, and people were also given a tattoo. There were no more people who had names. We all had numbers, except our group, when we arrived to Birkenau, they were so much in a hurry to get rid of us 
that they didn't even bother to give us a number. So none who were in my group ever had a number. You might have seen people with a number on their wrist, but we didn't get that. So after we were disrobed and had the num and people who got the numbers another time, and we, our heads were shaved, we had to go to a sh what they called a, sh a disinfecting shower. And the showers were little water coming from the ceiling. We stood on concrete floor. There was no warm water, cold, little cold water. And, and, and then we had to go through fast and pick out some clothes that belonged to anybody or not, not our own clothes. And that was our new clothes, whatever we picked up. And the last place that we had to go was to the barrack, which became the barrack where we stayed. 1,000 women together, all ages. You may have seen pictures that were like shelves, three layers. The, these were like plain wooden planks and no, no blanket, no, no, <laughs> it was just plain wooden plank. There'd be 10 people, 10 persons, lying side by side next to each other to keep each other warm because it was there, even though it was summer and we had no hair, it was cold at night in Poland. What did we do there? We did not know for how long. We did not know what happened with, to our parents. And yet we knew that we saw constantly the, there were selections being made. Every day, 90% of the day, we had to stand outside along one side of the barracks waiting to be either selected for work or selected for something else. Uh, meaning like if it didn't look like we were working force or we could work, it meant they, they don't want to stay, see us alive. <clears throat> Nobody dared to show that they did not feel well. Uh, standing outside, five persons in a row and the selections were made. They picked me out of the row a few times because I didn't look like a working person and, ex and put me into another barrack. And somehow, during the night, we were able to exchange me with somebody else who was also separated from their sister or their mother. So this was what went on in Poland, in in the camp in Auschwitz. Periodically, we would see people passing by with carts. There are people uh, who were not alive anymore, and they took them someplace. We did not know where they were taking, but we discovered it later. It was um, the crematoriums. What we, at the beginning, we could see this heavy smoke coming out from these large chimneys. We did not know what it meant, but later we figured out why they had to have that. They used to ask if anybody has some medical background. And one of my sisters studied medicine in, when she was in Prague. She was almost finished with her studies. She did not volunteer because we did not want to be separated. We, our aim was just to stay together, the four sisters. Whatever it happened, just wanted to be together. The, what was later, fight, fight, we found out what they asked people for people with medical background was those people were feeding the gas chambers and the crematoriums, the, the dead people, this, into this crematoriums, and for that they needed, according to this Nazi idea, to, to have medical background. 
any way that they could make people suffer. They managed to do that. The Germans and the Russians were already fighting at each other, and the Germans were not doing so well, and they were trying to get rid of the people in the camp in Auschwitz as fast as they could. Either they, sh they were sh be shot at or gassed, like this so-called disinfecting showers that we periodically we had to go to, sometimes it wasn't water that came out, it was gas came out from above, and they managed to kill so many people all at once. But the Russians kept coming closer, and so some of people they selected to send to some other camps. As it happens, I and my three sisters, we were put onto other cattle cars, and we did not know where they are going to take us or send us, but we figured it couldn't be worse than Auschwitz. And that's what happened. They put us in these cattle cars, and they took us to another camp. They liquidated the camp in January, 45, but before that they had hundreds and thousands of people to get rid of, and they managed to do it whichever way they could. At the end, they had what they called later the death march. They just let them march somewhere to another place, and whoever managed to survive was just by miracle. We, my sisters and I, and many others, were taken to another camp, which was in Germany. And the camps, well, you all probably heard of Bergen-Belsen. And we were taken from that Bergen-Belsen camp to a sub-camp, which was like a satellite camp of Bergen-Belsen that was called Tannenberg. Tannenberg, Tannenbaum in German is a fir tree, an evergreen, and Tannenberg, it's like a, a, a forest. So our camp was a small labor camp for 500 women, and we had to work in an ammunition factory there in the second camp. They gave us a uniform, the blue and gray striped dress, no underwear, no shoes, only wooden clogs, and it was winter time already. Like January, February, it was snowing, it was raining, it was freezing, and we had to go to work in this ammunition factory. My job was to cut stones with an ax. The stones were to be used for a roadway to lead from the campsite that the barracks were to the working place, the factory. And every morning, like five in the morning or four in the morning, we had to walk several miles or kilometers, um, big distances. I remember seeing the, the German farmers their, their sheds where they kept their tools. And I, my dream was if we could only live in one of those little sheds, which never happened, but that was my dream, that if I could just live like this with my sisters. And of course, we did not know what happened to our parents. We didn't know what happened to my sister with a little child. The war was already getting closer and closer in Germany. And so when we were in this camp, every night we were locked up into the barrack. This camp was only small. It only had three barracks because there were only 500 women. In this camp, every night we were locked up and we heard heavy bombers flying above. And we were hoping that the Americans or the British will come and bomb these areas. 
and we were told by the, uh, the guards, don't entertain such hopes because that won't happen. In fact, they did what they did was rehearse with us how they will get rid of us. We had to dig ditches so that when they shoot us, we will fall into the ditch and that's how we will end up. And this was our promise, what's going to happen to us. But one night, the SS guards, as usual, locked us into the barracks and they, the guards, escaped for their own lives and left the camp unattended. And one of my sisters in this camp was working in the kitchen where they made food for the SS guards. The, the cook was a, a Dutch man or a half German, half Dutch. He told these young women that if they want to have a chance to stay alive, they have an opportunity to escape because the camp is unattended, there are no guards, so everything was open. Of course, it was a camp, it was fenced in, the only thing, it didn't have guards. There was nobody who was able to help us, and, we, and what was that this one of my sisters was a very courageous, that was the one who went with me to check up on our house. She said, she's going to jump through the window where, the, where she was working, and whoever wants to go with her, let's jump together. So we followed her. There were a few other people who did the same, who worked with her in the kitchen. We had to jump down and into the muddy ground because it, the snow already melted, and then on our stomachs, we managed to crawl into the woods and somehow luckily for us we were not noticed other people also had the same idea and they did the same but in the meantime the local civilians who lived in the neighborhood they did not want any of that that we should remain there they came with their own trucks and their own German shepherds and their own guns and forced everybody, whoever they could, into the trucks and took everybody to Bergen-Belsen. They came after us into the woods. They pulled every, everybody they could out of the woods and put them on the, truck, on the trucks. They did not find us, my three sisters and me, and a couple of other people. So we remained in the woods, and all the people, all the women, by that time, the 500 women, there were only like left 300, because most people got sick in the camp. If they got what they call dysentery, or they, they never recovered. There was no medication for them. So once they got sick, they just took them away and they never came back. So from the 500, there were only 300 that they ended up take, being taken to, to, uh, to Bergen-Belsen. So those 300 people who were taken, the war was almost, almost over. Only at the end of the war, when it was a, the, le, the British liberated that part, uh, then they came and helped the people with medications. They could not save everybody. Only from these 500, 300 women now, only 50 remained alive. We were in this uh, wood forest we all got sick. We were there for a couple of days, a few days. We were hungry. And we went back to the, our camp, the old camp, the labor camp where we were. And we were looking for some food. 
I, we didn't find anything, so we ended up going on the highway to see if we can find somebody who could help us. And we found some soldiers, American soldiers, black American soldiers, and I had this little knowledge of English. I asked what day it is. They said it's April 15, 1945. And two days later was my 15th birthday. So that was my big, big day of my life. And you can imagine, we were now four sisters. We were under the British zone because Germany was divided into British zone, Russian zone, and, and American zone. And the British people, I mean, who were serving in the army, they were very, very helpful to us, tried to find us a place to live. This was, but once we had something to eat and we could see that we were in the middle of Germany, and nobody from our other family, we knew where anybody was. So the Red Cross, International Red Cross, and other agencies started to come and help us. And then the, there was also the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Organization came to help. And a lot of people were helped, and we were too. But this is the way I had my, my, my life changed. From being a little girl, suddenly at 15, I was in Germany with my three sisters, and I am so lucky that I remained alive. And I'm so lucky that I remained healthy, and then my, of my family, that some of us remained alive. And you were all so attentive, you could hear sometimes my voice like disappeared. But it's not an easy subject to talk about. But I'm so grateful that you are all looking so happy and healthy and enjoy your family and appreciate your family because it's so very important. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Magda. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thank you for her daughter being here and her son-in-law. And we really, uh, I know your children, grandchildren. I know some of your grandchildren as well. And we just appreciate your story and all you have been through. And, um, you know, and hopefully we'll learn from it. And we'll learn um, about the horrible things that happened to us Jewish people and that we have survived. And here's a prime example right here. So we do not, don't have time today to debrief we'll do it next time next week okay we'll talk more about this next week and um i just want to thank you all for being so attentive and for listening and for being here and uh we'll talk again and thank you again magda for being here thank you so much all right you guys can thank you guys you guys are great you guys can all stand up you can go home <laughs> okay we'll talk if you want to talk about it on the way out please feel free thank you or you can come and thank magda if you'd like in person. <laughs>